I graduated five years ago, so I started at Sheffield in 2008, um, and I was just saying to Marie on the way up, I'm, I'm now so old that I don't get handed night out leaflets, I now get handed pension leaflets and things like that, so yeah, it's all a bit depressing coming, coming back, um, but thank you for having me, and yeah, hope, hope it's informative. Um, I thought it would be remiss not to start with what is one of the the biggest sports news stories, probably the biggest, one of the biggest news stories um, of the year, and it's, it's it's the fall of Sam Allardyce, who I believe has just just spoken to the to the media this morning, um, and he says he's he's very embarrassed about about what he was caught on film by the by Daily Telegraph undercover journalists um, doing. So so he was he was caught offering his services to go to, to the Far East for £400,000. He also, crucially, um, was shown on camera showing how to circumvent third-party ownership rules, um, which is something that the, the FA um, put in place a few years ago to, to, sort of, to stop corruption and that sort of thing. But I, thought we, I thought it was interesting that, that Big Sam said his downfall um, was as the result of entrapment. Um, these were journalists from, from the Daily Telegraph's investigations team and they decided to go undercover in order to expose Big Sam for, for doing this sort of thing. And I've noticed it's, it's, it's not only caused debate generally, you know, amongst the general population, but it's also caused a lot of debate among people, you know, people within journalism, different journalists have got, got vastly different viewpoints on this. Um, so I, I had a look quickly through the through the newspapers today to try find sort of the, the spectrum of opinion among journalists. And um, there's a man called Roy Greenside, who I'm, I'm sure you might have already come across or you'll come across over the next three years. He's he's a media commentator who works for the, for the Guardian, and he very much was defending this investigation as being in the in the public interest, um, which I don't, I don't know how many of you have done sort of public interest, you know, studied public interest. But basically, that if it's you know if it's if it's overwhelmingly you know as well as being interesting to the public, if it's if it's to expose sort of something crime or, or corruption that's going on, that it's a worthwhile process. Um, so he was he, he was saying Roy was saying there's a clear public interest justification in knowing that a man employed by the football association is offering advice on how to circumvent its rules. Um, which, which is under IPSO, which is the, 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 the sort of the body that protects um, sort of people as well as, as journalists, that, that it, would, it would satisfy their public interest defence. Um, and I actually agree with, with Roy. I think this was, this was a 10-month investigation and it was into the wider state of, of football. It wasn't just targeting um, Sam Allardyce. And, and they said it was a, as a result of people coming to them with tip-offs um, so it wasn't what they call a, a fishing expedition, which is where you'd, you'd go and you'd deliberately, your sole aim would be just to try to expose someone and you're not quite sure what you're going to get. They were fairly certain that, that Big Sam was up to no good. Um, and so, so, they, so they, they sort of have that as their public interest defence. Um, it, it's also, they often say that you shouldn't go after a, a lone person who's, who's sort of a little bit vulnerable. Who, who might be caught off guard. Sam, Sam Allardyce was actually there with his agent and another representative. Um, and, and there was, you know, there was suggestions in what he was saying that, that this sort of thing had happened before. So I actually, I, I agree that there was a public interest defence. I'd be interested to hear what, what you guys think as well. Um, but some sort of very well-respected colleagues and, and football journalists think that it, it wasn't necessarily in, in the public interest. Um, Danny Taylor, who some of you might read, he's, he's the, the Guardian's chief football writer um, and he's absolutely brilliant. So if you, if you don't read him, then, then you should. Um, but he, he, was, he was saying that, A, that Sam Allardyce doesn't deserve to lose his job um, or didn't deserve to lose his job. But he also said, it is unusual, perhaps, that it's the Daily Telegraph having a go at playing the fake shake. And there are parts of its coverage that, to be blunt, are questionab questionable, to say the least. Um, so he, I, I, don't, I don't know how, how aware you are all of the fake shake, um, but that was a journalist called Maza Mahmood who worked for the News of the World, who turned up some, some brilliant stories, um, spot fixing in, in cricket. Um, but 
<coughs> it ended up him going undercover, which was his usual so his usual way of getting stories ended up being his downfall. He was subject to a Crown Prosecution Service investigation. Um, Panorama did an expose on his, his methods. And Danny Taylor is, is implying that the Daily Telegraph have, have, have strayed into fake shake territory by doing this. I, I think this story is, is going to rumble on and on and it's, it's really going to be the cause of a lot of debate um, among journalists and you know the wider public as, as to what you know, what methods you can use um, for the sake of a story. Uh, Mark Ogden at The Independent, um, another very well-respected football writer, said, it's funny though how it's always open season on England managers. Perhaps Scots are whiter than the all-white selection policy our fearless press corps continually ignore while campaigning for quotas south of the border. I don't know. It just seems odd the way history keeps repeating itself and always in the same location. If the Telegraph wants to fill the gap left by the news of the world, it's going the right way about it. What I'd like to know is why they launched the operation and how much of it is political. Metropolitan broadsheets hate England. They hate Allardyce because he's English. Uh, and that's, that's quite an interesting point that he's making, that there was some sort of hidden agenda as to why they were going after Sam Allardyce. I'm sure the Telegraph investigations team would defend it because they say that you know, they had reason, to, they had prima facie evidence um, to believe that you know that, that that Sam was trying to circumvent um, these third-party ownership rules, and that it was a ten-month investigation that he just happened to be the biggest the biggest name involved. Um, but it is it is true that s that sports journalism sports journalism is becoming a lot of the best sports journalism is based on investigations. It's it's not based on press conferences and on post-match you know post-match press press conferences. It's based on, on, you know, big investigations. There is obviously, you know, plenty of brilliant journalism that goes on away from that. But you've got the FIFA files, which led to the, that was, that was in the Sunday Times, um, which led to the downfall of Seth Blatter recently. We also at the, um, at the Mail, this is a story that I did with my colleague, Nick Harris. Um, and this is, this is actually from July 2013. Um, and this, you'll have sort of seen the, this came to fruition three years later, sort of this <laughs> summer, um, with Russia, the Russian team being banned from the Rio Paralympics and great swathes of the Russian team um, being banned from, from the Olympics as well. But this, this, this is something that came by chance, someone calling into the office who I ended up talking to at the time. Um, it was a man called Oleg Popov, who, is a, who, who was a Russian athletics coach. Um, and he, he was alleging that the athletes were being ordered to dope by the higher ups within within Russian athletics. So by coaches um, and by the very top man within Russian athletics, um, within Russian sports, sorry, by the, the sports minister, um, a man called Vitaly Mutko, who amazingly is still in his job even after all the, 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 the sort of the revelations about Russia. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of go through what it takes to do, do an investigation like this. We had... 40,000 words of, of transcripts um, we had you know about a dozen different different sources and we had three of us working on it for, for three months and we came up we came up with this piece in the end um, which which actually was not not perhaps given the amplification that it would have been been given if we'd have known what was going to happen three years later um, but yeah I've spent a lot of my year writing about doping as athletics correspondent you know we often say myself and the other athletics correspondents that we may as well be called doping correspondents because that is what we spent most of our year sort of writing about and you've you've had to become experts almost on anti-doping and the process and um, yeah and, and drug taking and knowing what's best to take and um, to get the optimum performance so if anyone wants any advice I'm, I'm your girl um, yeah, and so, so, so I've ended up writing about this, and, and this piece is, is from July 2016, so a couple of months ago, which is three years after that original story. And this is, this is, this is a report after the, um, after the World Anti-Doping Agency report came out into, into Russian athletics, and it exposed things like um, a, a secret service agent posing as um, an engineer saying he was going to fix the toilets actually going into a laboratory at the Sochi Olympics and passing um, passing sort of uh, 
anti-doping samples, so urine samples through the wall. Um, and it is something, it's something that you, you would have expected, you know, in, in the Cold War era, perhaps not in, you know, not in the 21st century. Um, and here we sort of, sort of put Russia cheated the world with a plot straight out of a spy novel. Um, but it was just interesting that this has taken so long to, to come to fruition, whereas with the Big Sam case, you've got someone on camera and there's, there's no denying what he said. And you sort of, within 36 hours of, of the Big Sam story being on the, the front page of the Telegraph, he's gone because of that, that, that sort of, that overwhelming swell of, of public opinion and, and the fact that his job had become untenable with, with what he'd said. But it is, it is always, you know, if, if you're going to do something like that, it's, it's easier to have someone on, on camera because you can't say I didn't say that because you're, you're, you're sat there on, on camera. Um, <coughs> this is, this is an, another story. It's just an example of having contacts. I'm sure if, if, if you, you know, the ones of you who, are just, who have just started, I'm sure sort of your lecturers will Im impress on you the, the importance of having a wide range of contacts. Everyone you meet out on your patches, um, I had my patch was the, the city centre patch. Everyone you meet when you, when you go out on stories, get their name and their number um, and give them a ring every so often because you don't know what you, what you might hear. Um, this is an example of where I, I, I stumbled upon a story but through a contact that I'd, I'd kept in close contact with. Um, I don't know whether any of you saw the story at the time. Um, this, this lady is a cyclist called Jess Varnish um, who used to cycle with Victoria Pendleton on the, on the Great Britain team. She's a, a world championship gold medalist, a Commonwealth gold medalist, um, a hugely, hugely impressive cyclist. Um, and I was in contact with, with her agent. I happened to give her, her agent a call um, when Jess got let go from, from the Great Britain team. And it seemed odd timing so close to the Olympics. This was, this was April this year. Um, and she'd obviously been working towards the Olympics the last four years, the, the very biggest thing in her life. Um, she missed out on, they missed out on a medal in, in London. I don't know who, if anyone watched at London 2012, but they'd broken the world record, her, she and Victoria Pendleton, earlier that year, and there ended up being, being a false start and they got disqualified. And, and so Rio was a chance for her to, to make amends for that. And it, you know, it was a hugely important thing. Anyway, she, she was axed from the team um, back in March and ended up doing, doing an interview with, with myself at, at, the, at the Daily Mail and she made some quite, quite sort of stark allegations about um, Shane Sutton who was the performance director at British Cycling at the time and she said not only did she feel like she'd been let go unfairly she also made allegations that, that he'd told her to sh she went in basically to collect her stuff from the, the velodrome in Manchester where she'd been training and she collected all her belongings uh, and on the way out um, Jess alleges that Shane Sutton, she said to Shane something along the lines of you know why have I been let go, she was trying to get her, her performance data to try and build a case against British Cycling for, for, for letting her go and, and he said oh just go off and have a baby Jess is what she, she alleges. She also says that, that while she was with British Cycling that, that he told her, her her bum was too big to cycle. Um, I've seen her, her bum is not too big to cycle. But no, she's, but she's hugely impressive and she, she made some, some allegations against him. As a result of that, I then got... Um, I, I, I sort of I made, made a few more calls to try and find out if there was any substance to, to, to what other people were sort of saying to me. You hear things on the grapevine. And I, I ended up speaking to a few people who were named within this article on the right um, about paracyclists, about Paralympic cyclists. And um, a lot of them were alleging that Shane Sutton was using sort of offensive terms to describe paracyclists. Um, as, yeah, as you can see there, gimps and wobblies is what he called them. Um, so at one stage, Shane Sutton, and these are all allegations at the moment, there's an ongoing invest British cycling investigation into this, um, but he was alleged to say at one point, um, get those effing gimps off my effing track, um, because he, he apparently seemingly didn't want the, the British paracycling team taking up the track while he wanted to get his Olympic cyclists um, onto, onto, the, onto the track. Um, 
this, this ended up resulting in Shane Sutton resigning as the performance director of British Cycling. Um, and yeah, as I say, there's, there's a, a, an ongoing investigation which we're expecting, um, expecting the outcome of shortly um, from, from that's, that's taken place between UK Sport, which is the body which allocates national lottery funding um, to British Cycling and to other Olympic sports. They're looking into, into whether, um, you know, whether there's truth to these claims and if there's anything else. So they've invited um, every single sort of former staff member who's been there while Shane Sutton's been there to, to come to them with information. They've, they've apparently um, done lots of, of interviews, um, hours and hours of interviews with, with people like, like Victoria Pendleton, like Jess Varnish, like Chris Hoy. Um, <coughs> And, and there's, you know, it's quite an interesting debate because there's, there's a debate as to whether um, Shane Sutton had to be hard and had to be, if he was, had to be abusive in order to get the best results from his cyclists. So some people are saying, oh, they're, they're just soft for complaining. Um, so it's sort of in, it's, it's, that, that was one of my favourite stories to work on because it was so fast moving, because the results happened so quickly, sort of Shane Sutton, similar to the, similar to the Sam Allardyce case. Um, Shane Sutton within, within four days of, of the Jess Varnish interview appearing in the paper as a result of the other claims that came to light both in the Daily Mail and in other, other papers as well had, had, had you know, brilliant stuff on it. Um, because of that, he, he, was, he was gone from his position within four days. Um, so yeah, it's sort of an example of, of what your journalism can do, you know, the results it, it can have. It's, it's not just sort of sending it into the ether. You can have... Um, you know, you can have, you know, good sort of hard results quite, quite quickly. Um, yeah, I'll go on to, I, I got back from, from Rio, as, as Peter was saying, on Wednesday. Um, so I've been back a week, so I'm still a little bit jet lagged. You'll be able to tell from my golden tan uh, that I've been there, not. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd just go through a bit of what, what it's like to, um, to cover the Olympics. Um, it's something that you work up to for, I've been, work, I, I've been working up to it for sort of two years and you're, you're building up contacts that perhaps you wouldn't normally speak to because you're not involved within Olympic sport the whole time. Um, I've got quite a lot of athletics contacts because I work in athletics, but a lot of the time I work in, I work in football. <coughs> um, so I've, I cover, you know, I cover games and press conferences and things the rest of the time. So I'm, I'm not sort of absorbed in this, but I'd, you make a significant effort before the Olympics to try and make sure you've got numbers for people if stories do occur that you can ring that you can get quotes from um, that you can try and break stories from um, but there's also you know a, a lot of it's about speaking to athletes and about doing features <coughs> a lot of a lot of sports journalism is is feature writing there's i think some of my favorite feature writers are sports journalists and um, there's some 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 brilliant brilliant journalism out there um, people at our paper like matt lawton and ian ladyman and and Martin Samuel, who's our chief sports writer, they're, they're some of the best, the best writers across all papers. Um, and I think sports journalism does encourage that, like, that, that good writing, because you're given space and things. Um, but this is, this, is, um, this is not a brilliant feature. This is just an example of, of something I did at the Olympics. Um, so the British team always goes for um, a few weeks before the Olympics start. They go to a preparation camp. Um, it's basically a chance for them to get acclimatised to the weather, to the environment, um, but also to make sure that they're away from the distractions of being at home. So a lot of them, a lot of them take themselves off, off Facebook, off Twitter, off Instagram, and they literally just eat, sleep, train. Um, so this is um, this is obviously on the on the right there. That's um, that's Adam Peaty, who won won gold in the hundred metres breaststroke. Um, which is obviously our, our best. I think it was the, the first since night, the first man to win a swimming gold medal since uh, 1988, I think, since Adrian Morehouse. And we spent, you know, the day looking round the the training camp. It was in a place called Belo Horizonte, which is about an hour flight away from Rio. Um, and that's the that's the swimming pool, um, which was there. Um, that's Fra Fran Halsell, who's probably a swimmer that some of you have heard of. Um, and Adam Peaty sort of doing, doing press ups and things. But it was, it was also, as well as sort of being a chance to speak to all these people, you know, there was pe uh, Nicola Adams was up there, so I spoke to her. Um, 
it was also a lesson in, in always keeping your eyes and, and ears open for, for things that, that are going on. Um, I noticed that there was, um, I went to interview Heather Fisher, who's a rugby sevens player, who, who herself was a very interesting story. Um, she's a lady with, with alopecia. You might have seen her when, if you watched any of the rugby sevens, um, which was brilliant in Rio. Um, but I, I did an interview with her and, and we were in the team hotel in Belo Horizonte. And um, there was, there was a, an 800 metre runner, a young guy called Elliot Giles. And I noticed he was with, he was with some of the, the, the British athletics team members and he was, um, he was complaining about he'd lost his kit. But his kit had actually been lost by British Airways, which is the sponsor of Team GB. And he, he was moaning that they'd, they'd made no effort to try and locate his... Um, they'd made no effort to try and locate his kit. And so it was, it was four days after he'd arrived and he had no running spikes. So he was having to do his, his sessions on the track, but in normal training shoes, he was having to borrow kit. And it just struck me that it was so odd that we've got a sponsor of, of Team GB, and yet they've not managed to get the, the kit out there for you know, one, of their, one of their athletes. Um, so it ended up being, being quite you know, productive because I got this story from, from Elliot, um, as well as having you know, decent feature stuff um, in the run-up. Yeah, I think, so, so I spent a week in Belo Horizonte and then went down to Rio proper and a place called Baja de Tijuca, which is near the Olympic Park. And I think the Olympics, most of all, is a lesson in, in covering sports, which perhaps you, you, you not covered before. Um, I knew I was going to be doing, so for the first week I did gymnastics mainly, and I knew I was going to be doing that. So I tried to, to, to watch a few you know, gymnastics events, tried to get to know the, the people involved. But you realise when you get there that there's only so many ways you can describe how to do a forward roll. <laughs> And, how to, and these, these athletes are sensational, like they're unbelievable, but you, you don't know how to describe, you know, the flips that they're doing um, unless, you're, you know, unless you're a gymnastics journalist. But as, as always with sport, there tends to be, a, you know, a storyline that, that stands out. Um, so this is the one from, from that day. That's a, a, a young gymnast um, called Ellie Downey. And she ended up landing on her head during the, during the routine. As you can see, it's, it looks incredibly painful and awkward. Um, but yeah, she, she ended up being wheeled from the, um, from the arena floor in a wheelchair. And then 10 minutes later, she was, she was back, in the, um, yeah, back in the arena doing flips from the, the vault. And it was, it was incredible. Um, yeah, I think, I think one of the most exciting things for, for me about the Olympics, and I, d I didn't think it would be because I'm not, I don't follow gymnastics that closely, um, was seeing Simone Biles, who's the American gymnast. I don't know whether anyone saw her, um, but her, her floor routines were some of the most amazing things I've, I've ever seen. Um, and I saw sort of, uh, with the Olympics, it tends to be everyone goes, with the exception of some of the top football writers who stay here to cover the start of the Premier League season. Most of the, the, you know, most of the big name journalists tend to go to the Olympics. And so I saw people who've, you know, been journalists for 40 years, you know, who predominantly cover football and, you know, have been to Champions League finals saying that Simone Biles routine was the best thing I've ever seen. Um, that's, how, that's how good it was. And I think the Olympics sort of allows you to enjoy different sports. Um, my colleague Riath here, um, he covered the... Um, he covered the, the, te the, the fencing, sorry, which is obviously something he's never covered before, but he actually came up with one of my favourite um, favorite intros of the whole Olympics. He put foil the game. Where if, you know, if you know fencing, you'll know they, they call their, um, the things that they wear foils. Um, and so I thought that was brilliant. It was this, this guy who's been beaten at London 2012 and then again he was beaten in Rio. Um, yes, yeah, so I thought foil the game was quite clever. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the things I was covering. Um, I think this is probably something I've had the most privilege to, to, to be at. And there are moments, being a sports journalist, when you, you pinch yourself um, because you're, you're doing things which you, know, you never, ever imagined in your <coughs> wildest dreams you'd be doing. I watched Usain Bolt in Beijing in, in 2008 um, on the TV, obviously. I watched him in, in London um, on the TV as well. And he was going for the, the triple, triple um, in Rio. So the, the triple of titles, the 100 metres, the 200 metres and the four by 100 metres. Um, so I think, yeah, be, being there and, and seeing him do that, it was one of those moments where you think, oh, it's, it's probably worth the fact that I've, you know, 
been up for however many hours um, and that sort of thing. So this is um, this is also this is um, just gone to the next page. So this is this is a three a.m. special. So covering the Olympics in Rio was probably more of a challenge than it is in practically any other place in the world because of the time difference. Um, so Rio is is four hours behind. So when Usain Bolt was running in Rio, it was 10.30 in the, night of in, the in the evening, sorry, 10.30 in the evening in the Olympic <coughs> Stadium in Rio, but back home it was 2.30 in the morning. And so the challenges of, of, of managing to, to get your copy over when the internet's, you know, a, a little bit dodgy um, is, is, is huge and you're, you're constantly on edge. So I'd actually taken with this, this one was his, um, yeah, this one was his, his 100 metres one, but we, we stayed open obviously for, for Bolt's 200 metres and his four by 100 metres. I think for the, for the whole Olympics, we had, I think three or four, three AM editions, which were because you don't want, you want to, you want to, you have the pride as a paper, even though the 3 a.m. editions don't actually go that far. The 3 a.m. Ed editions generally only go to a small area of the country, which are near the printing presses. But you want to be able to, as a, a sports section, to be able to have the report of Usain Bolt winning, you know, winning the 100 metres again or winning his do completing the triple triple. Um, but I actually did. So, so you write the report as a what they call a runner. Um, so the, the bottom half of this report or from from here down um, is is based on the night's other events and then you sort of take a risk and in, 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 in fact with this one I had a report ready if Usain Bolt lost and one ready for if he won I thought he would win actually but I, I had one ready for both just because the deadlines are so tight so within within I think within a minute and a half of him crossing the line I'd filed my 300 words top um, to the desk in London so that they could get it on the page and they obviously did a brilliant job with all, all the graphics and that sort of thing to get that um, to get that ready at that stage um, yeah this this was another story that was late that night the um, the the hockey girls winning gold which um, which I, one of my colleagues was was covering and I think that was one of those stories which the, the thing with the Olympics is it can throw up stories that you don't expect um, you sort of know if you know you know with football if it's a big Champions League game if you've got Man United Barcelona or Arsenal Bayern you know that it's it's going to be your back page story. With with the Olympics, it's so brilliant because it, it throws up you know stars who you've never heard from before. That lady Sam Quek, um, who probably you know I I'd never never heard of before because I, I don't follow hockey that closely, and she ended up you know th that team ended up being the stars of the Olympics for me. Um, yeah, just just sort of yeah, a little bit more about the Olympics and, and the Paralympics. Um, it, I, I ended up staying out for, for two weeks between the Olympics and the Paralympics, and you get a chance to join the Olympics. It's, it's so hectic. You're getting up at sort of six a.m. and you're not getting to bed until two a.m. So you're existing on very little sleep, um, and you know the, the, the food <laughs> the food in Brazil was 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 pretty bad as well so in the stadium you shouldn't really moan about the food when you're at the olympics um but sort of you you were getting maybe a cheese cheese they have a thing called cheese bread um which is borderline inedible um and you might get like a you know a, a, a shot of coffee um there was no water in the stadium a lot of the time so you had to make sure that you were you were coming in with you know bottles of water and things so it's 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 a stressful event to cover as well as being amazingly exciting and fun and an absolute privilege. It is also it is also very sort of stressful to cover it. And so I had, I was staying out for eight and a half weeks. Um, so for the Olympics and right up until the end of the Paralympics, which finished um, a week ago on Sunday. Um, so finished about twelve days ago now. Um, so I had two weeks in between to sort of see some of Rio, and then it was straight back into the the Paralympics. Um, which is another challenge because we went from having a team. So at the Olympics, the, the Daily Mail had a team of, of nine people. We had seven sports reporters and two news reporters to the Paralympics where it was, it was, I was the only one covering it for sport. Uh, and then there was, there was a man covering it for news for us as well. Um, but I think that for me was an even bigger challenge perhaps than the Olympics because with the Paralympics, you've got to not only learn who are the big stars again, um, 
to learn, you know, the, the different sports. There's a sport, for example, called boccia, um, which I n know very, very little about, um, although I do know a little bit more about it now. Um, and, and, and also, I don't know how much you read in the papers in the summer, in the lead up to the, to the Paralympics, but there was a debate over classification, which dominated the sort of the, 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 the news agenda around the Paralympics, um, which is to do, they tried to match up people's disability with someone of a similar disability. But there were suggestions within the British team that um, th there was a, a lady called Bethany Woodward who had cerebral palsy, and she said the people who she was racing against had um, less severe cerebral palsy than, than she had. And so it becomes one of those minefields where you're not quite sure what you can write, and, and you've really got to sort of talk to people and, and get other people's expertise on a, a subject, um, which I think applies to, to a lot of journalism. It's, it's, it's about the ability to become an expert in, you know, for a short period in, you know, in many, many different subjects. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's something I've definitely learned since I've, since I've been at the Mail. Um, yeah, a, a, little bit about, a little bit about me and how, how I got into it. Um, as I said, I graduated in, in 2011 and I started on the, the mail trainee scheme, the Daily Mail and Mail on Sunday trainee scheme, um, the following September. Um, but they actually, <coughs> they actually came into the university on a recruitment drive. So there were about 10 of us who, who went to interviews um, that year um, to, try, to try and get on the, the trainee scheme. And it is, it's, it's a, if you do want to go into newspaper journalism, it's a really, really good way in. A lot of the, a lot of the newspapers and a lot of the websites run trainee schemes. Um, we have, we've got, I think, maybe five staff members just on the sports desk, um, probably more, than, probably five or six, who are products of the trainee scheme, um, which is, is a huge amount given, given sort of the fact that our, probably our, our desk in total is about 25 people maybe, um, and, then, and then more in the office probably. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's a good way to get in. Also, trying to, and I, I asked some some of the some of the journalists to to give advice, and someone said, I think very wisely, they said, make yourself an industry, so make yourself a name, um, make sure you're tweeting a lot, and um, make sure you're interacting with journalists. As long as you're not abusive, most journalists tend to tend to respond. Don't email them saying lazy journalism or you're clueless because <laughs> that'll get their back up. But um, yeah, try, try and interact with them. Try and make sure you're on, on their radar. Um, try and start a, a, a blog or something like that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of sort of um, websites that you can contribute to, particularly with sports journalism. Um, I would also say I, I, I was quite lucky in that my um, my dad and my uncle are both journalists, so they had contacts who I could get work experience with. But actually, the amount of people who I've managed to get work experience who who have just emailed me saying, "Hi, Martha, I, I like your stuff. I read, you know, even if you, even if you don't particularly like someone's stuff, <laughs> or if you've not read their stuff, just say 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 you have. Try read up, you know, some of what they've written." Um, don't get what they do wrong because that's that's annoying. But if if you say, you know, I've, I've read your stuff, like it. Um, I'd I, you know I'd really like to look at getting into sports journalism. Is there any advice you can offer? Can you get me a, a work experience placement? Generally, journalists are, are willing to help, and they'll put you in contact with the, the relevant people. Um, I always do if, if someone emails me. We've got we've got a really long waiting list for placements, but we always usually get people in, particularly if they're keen and they can show that they've got experience if they can show they've got examples of work that they've done and they seem like they'd be willing to contribute um, we have you know one or two people in every week on the sports desk of the mail and I know other papers do as well and that's a really good way um, to get yourself to get yourself noticed and a colleague of, of, of mine was saying that he showed up in at the uh, on, on work experience I think in, in March last year or the year before and the 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 boss was impressed because he was contributing ideas and he was coming up with good stats and and that sort of thing um, and he said why don't you apply for the for the trainee scheme and this guy ended up applying and now he's he's, he's a um, staff writer on the paper so it does it does work if you're willing to put in the um, put in the time and um, this probably goes without saying and I'm, I'm sure you've heard it before but 
expect to work long and sociable hours and at least at the start expect to do it for, for relatively low pay as well and this is not just sports journalism this is journalism across the board particularly if you start in local papers they're they're cash strapped um, and you don't get much much money at first so don't get into it if, if you know if you're expecting sports cars and big houses in london because um yeah it's it's not it's not the industry that you, that you get that sort of that's those sort of rewards from but there's there's obviously lots of other rewards you get to go to events that you know the general public pay hundreds of pounds to go to um, this is sports journalism, um, but also news journalism, you know, you get to be around hugely inspirational people um, and you get to break stories, which is, you know, one of the biggest adrenaline rushes. And I never get up in the morning and sort of dread having to go to work. I am slightly dreading going back on Tuesday after eight weeks in Brazil, but you never, you never normally, you know, you never, I never, you know, I never have that fear when I wake up in the morning of going into work because it's something different every day. Um, it's exciting and you don't quite know what's what's going to happen every day and um, and it, it generally is it's it's there's quite a sense of, of camaraderie among journalists um, you know it tends to be quite sort of it tends to be quite funny people and it. it's, it's it's a good it's a good laugh for the, for the most part um, yeah so someone else said learn from the best um, read journalism across the journalistic spectrum even if you're just interested in sport or just interested in politics um, or just interested in crime news, try and read stuff from, from everyone. Um, yeah, one of my favourite writers is Camilla Long, a feature writer. Caitlin Moran, a feature writer, one of my favourite writers. And uh, yeah, don't isolate yourself just to reading the sports pages or just to reading the news, news pages because it, it often crosses over. You know, there's, there's things like, you know, for, for instance, employment law often in fact affects footballers from from outside the EU coming into the EU so you're aware of all that sort of stuff um, there is there is a lot of, of, of crossover um, yeah this is more, this is more logistical find out the Wi-Fi password uh, always um, yeah and have patience because the Wi-Fi won't work a lot of the time um, yeah also th this is this is I think quite a key one and even even one that you can you can start looking you can start looking f like at immediately, like even when even when you're still at university, try and ally yourself with someone at a newspaper. Um, one of we, we've we've got a guy called Adam Crafton who works works for us, and he's he's just out of university, but he's been he's been working for the Mail for probably since I have for, for years now because he started um, suggesting ideas and stories whilst he was whilst he was at university. I think he, he went to I think he went to Oxford or Cambridge and. He, he learnt languages, which which helps as well. But he also um, he also became friendly with the people on the desk. He became friendly with the editor. But but yeah, f find yourself someone who is willing to help you out above other people. Um, when I first started, um, my colleague Nick Harris, who was on, I started out on the Mail on Sunday, um, so I was just working sort of for the one paper a week. And you go through stretches when you're just working for a Sunday paper. To be honest, most of them are by the time you guys graduate, most of them will be seven days anyway. Um, but working for a Sunday paper, it can be quite lonely um, at the start of the week when you're sort of scrapping around for ideas and you're thinking, what, you know, what do I do? What do I do now? What do I do on a Tuesday when I'm not probably going to be writing anything until a Friday or a Saturday? And, and Nick Harris, who was, who was my colleague, very much helped me out. He gave me ideas of, of people to talk to, about contacts to make. Um, and yeah, just, just, you know, advice on... On, on what to say when you go to a press conference. Um, always introduce yourself to people as well. Like, don't don't be shy of, of you know saying who you are and, and what you want to do because generally people are, are very friendly um, if if they see that you know you're keen and that you're bright and that you appreciate what journalism is about. They'll generally you know they'll generally give you good advice. Mm -hmm.